The following program is brought to you by Fanbags Cornhole, Chicago's official supplier of professional cornhole boards and bags. Choose from any of their officially licensed designs or have my boy Brian design a custom set using anything from a selfie to your company's logo. Visit www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS to get 10% off your entire order. That's www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS to get 10% off. Step up your game with Fanbags Cornhole. It's Zach Eady with the Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back to Boilers in the Stands post game show. I am your host, Greg Braggs Jr., and alongside me, as always, is my guys, Joe Jackson and Craig Bowers. Uh, Purdue wins. It was a sketchy game. We're going to get into it. Uh, but Purdue battles and battles and battles. And, uh, you know, Michigan State made it interesting at the end, a very physical game you know, in Minnesota. And obviously I think that, you know, the lead of this game is, you know, the, the curse of Minnesota. And I think any Purdue fan knows the history there uh, with Purdue and some bad luck in Minnesota, knock on wood. Uh, Braden Smith at one point comes up limping, holding his knee, you know, somewhat of a non-contact moment. And uh, all of Purdue nation and boiler nation held their, collective breaths as Braden Smith laid on the floor. And we saw a little bit of this, you know, last week as they were closing out the regular season where both Zach Eady and Braden Smith hit the deck. And that was also against Michigan state, correct? Uh, when they clinched the, the championship at home at Mackey arena, or was it yeah, against Wisconsin yeah, was, was when they both Wisconsin was when Braden Smith, like went to the locker room. That's right. It was Wisconsin. I apologize. So, you know, in, in, in back-to-back games here, um, you know, we've had some scares and, um, and I know boiler fans, you know, pro- I know I was terrified. I was producing a CHGO Bears show and I'm in the background and I'm, I was sick to my stomach as I saw that. And, um, you know, somehow by some miracle, Braden Smith comes back out there and finishes the game. I texted these guys. I'm like, what are we doing? Like just sit, <laughs> sit him out. I I like I and and but you know what? That's not who Matt Painter is. That's probably not who Braden Smith is. If he heard that I was suggesting that, he'd he'd probably take exception to me saying that. And so, hey, I respect it. I respect you know their dedication and toughness. But at the same time, you know we're all kind of holding our breaths here over the next couple of days. Uh, seeing if they'll get through this Big Ten tournament unscathed. As we all know, they have bigger fish to fry in the NCAA tournament in March Madness. So, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll kick it to you, Craig, and, and give your instant reaction uh, to the win and everything else that, uh, you know, uh, unfolded. Yeah, um, I, I'm just going to go with I'm thankful uh to the high heavens that we appear to have came out of this game relatively healthy um i'm betting somebody just put in the chat that right after the game painter said that it was a calf injury not a knee injury to Braden. so i don't know if he he strained that calf muscle or what um 
Edie comes up kind of gimpy on an ankle at one point in time in there too, uh, late in the game. So I, I'm just number one, um, happy that it appears that both guys are going to be okay. I'm sure they're going to be a little bit sore tomorrow, but to me, that's really all I care about. And to be quite frank, and I know we were talking about this in the group text a little bit, there were some things, especially after Smith went out and came back in, that kind of looked like maybe Purdue didn't really care all that much whether they closed this one out. There were a couple of loose balls that you normally see guys diving on the floor that they looked like they maybe made a business decision. There were a couple contests at the rims, um, kind of looked like guys made a business decision of, uh, you know, this, this isn't necessarily our goal. And if we can win this one, great, but bigger things ahead. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what this says about Michigan State exactly. And obviously we can't know, right? We're not in the players' heads or anything like that. But at best, I would call this a C game maybe by Purdue. And effort-wise right at the end and, and just kind of looking where maybe heads were at for Purdue. Um, it's almost a little bit sad that Michigan State couldn't pull this one out somehow because it really looked like it was there for the taking if Michigan State wanted it. Yeah, it was um, like... I said it in the second half. It just looked like MSU was going like as hard as they possibly could. And then I, I'm not going to say Purdue wanted to lose, right? Because I think that would be taken away from the players. Um, I, I think there was a moment for sure that MSU wanted it more. But MSU was going full out and, and Purdue was spooked. Obviously, after Smith goes down, I mean, you see Edie kind of be a little bit gimpy after the, the ankle. Um, everything kind of seems fine there, too. So it was just this area where in the second half where it was just like Purdue was just trying to get to the end of the game. And MSU, I think was like trying their hardest to win. Um, and like, I don't know if Purdue necessarily beat Michigan state today as much as Michigan state just beat themselves. Like if Michigan state shoots even a decent night, um, they're, they're probably moving on in this. And if that happens, I don't know how many Purdue fans are too upset with that outcome, but at the end of the day, there's you know going to be a lot of discussion about the Big Ten tournaments and what it means and health and how many minutes should these guys play and all that. At the end of the day, Purdue just beat a, a, a hungry team that we just talked about, right? They they were they were giving it their all in the second half um, on a night where Purdue was spooked in that second half and for a while couldn't make that, make a shot. Purdue still wins that on a neutral floor, like so. So I think as as there should be, there should be a lot of discussion we'll have today about like the injuries and, and the minutes and all that stuff, but. I don't think we can quite look over like, hey, Purdue did win this. Like, this isn't a game that they probably win last year. And we've said that how many times this season at this point. Um, they do win it. They do pull it out. And so, well, we'll talk about the future. But there is also yeah. that aspect of they they figure out a way to pull it out. Fletch hits that big three, stuff like that. And Joe, like, even on Painter's side of this, that's the first time all year I can remember him not going offense for defense down the stretch mm -hmm. against a team with really good guards. And it was just like, it was weird. Okay, what are we, what are we doing? <laughs> like we just, you know, you guys yep. going to be okay. If Fletch gets cooked on the other end and just live with it. Like, I don't know. It just, a it few things. Just Well, and we, <laughs> and we, and we asked uh, Bobby buckets, Bobby Riddell was on with us last week and we asked him, you know, do you think that painter will have different types of rotations here to end the year? And, you know, it, it, it's not a ridiculous notion. And, you know, we even saw in the final game against Wisconsin, miles Colvin getting extra minutes and maybe he's earned those through practice. So, you know, I don't think painters out here given, you know, charity minutes, but at the same time, maybe there is a thought to, you know, um, switching up the rotations a bit and trying to get some guys lesser minutes, you know, uh, there's a lot of wear and tear on the season. You got a lot of mileage on those legs for all these guys. They play heavy minutes. And I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, that kind of a strategy. But, you know, I'm not, not sure all. if Painter, you know, and I'm sure he'll be asked in, in the postgame presser about that philosophy here potentially ain't nobody, said, ain't nobody asking him that in that room <laughs> well i mean i think there's a right and wrong way to phrase it but you know just any consideration to how you approach the next two games i mean i don't think there's anything out of bounds with asking it if i was in that room i'd be asking and i know that blake widmer you know asking here in the chat saying horrible game should have just rested everyone like bill self did he's a legend coach because he knows which fights to battle Painter should be resting Edie and Smith. So strong words from Blake. I mean, 
I would say but those that, guys were hurt for Kansas that self rested. Yeah, like, yeah. They have significant injuries. I don't know if he's referencing this year or is he referencing a, I, a year? I assume because you know, then Ken, um, Kansas got bounced right away okay. in the journey. There and, is and, the. Uh, you know, when we're talking about pedigree of coaches, I think Matt Painter is every bit on the level of Bill Self. You put Matt Painter in Kansas and that recruiting area and, and, and ability over the last 10 years, uh, it wouldn't surprise me in the least uh, if Bill's, you know, if Matt Painter had a very similar resume to Bill Self. But I understand the concern and frustration. I literally texted these guys, what the hell are we doing? Sit Braden the rest of the game. I, I just, for me, you know, as reactionary and, and scared the shit out of me to be quite frank. And I, like, I had no interest in him playing the rest of the game and, and you can call me soft or whatever, but I'm being honest with you about why, you know, what I was feeling in the moment. And so, but at the same time, that's not who these guys are. So i give them all the credit in the world. And to Joe's point, I'm not trying to downplay the win. Uh, at all they, these guys continue to show toughness. They show up for every single game. Uh, and Dick still wagon here in the chat brags is soft. All right, fine. I'll take it. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm not going to come out here and pound my chest. I'm going to tell you exactly how I felt in the moment. And if you're going to sit here and say you weren't terrified when that stuff went down, uh, Hey, more power to you. I don't know if I exactly believe you. So it is what it is. I mean, we're going to have to, you know, they're going to play similar rotations here in the next two games. Uh, tomorrow they're going to have the winner of Wisconsin Northwestern, which is, uh, just about to tip off here soon. And, uh, we'll just have to see how everything p plays out and hopefully they win games and, and, and come out unscathed as, as the saying goes, survive in advance as Shan Cox puts here in the chat. Yeah. And Braggs, if you're soft as a much longer tenured Purdue fan than either of you, who's lived through some of these injuries, um, you know, the Glenn Robinson back injury, the Hummel injury, the Haas injury. Right. Um, I thought it was a lot worse than it was. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't need to have a Brian Tonsoni viral moment here or anything, but I genuinely started tearing up immediately. Like I, I thought it was done and I thought the curse hit us again. And I just, I mean, immediately started tearing up. So if you're soft, um, I'm the softest. So <laughs> well, this is honesty hour. So Joe, when the moment happened, you know, what was your reaction? Were you crying? I almost threw Dude, up. <laughs> I, I, I tweeted it. Um, you guys know the, when they cut to Izzo right before the end of the first half and he was just, Oh, uh, I didn't know what that was in context to. That was, that was my, that was like my reaction. I just sat there for like a minute like that and, and didn't move. Um, it also like, and we'll talk about the game. Like it made, and, and I, I got to be better, but like it made it harder for me to analyze the second half too. Like um, I, I just wasn't quite into it as much as like I could have or should have been. Um, it was, yeah, it was just all like, please be fine. Please no injury. Every fall was just like, yeah. get up. Edie's ankle thing was like, that looks bad. T take him out. Yep. Um, it, yeah. yeah the way Edie landed awkwardly where his knee kind of bent backwards. Like, yeah. yeah. Hey, Chubbs and in the chat. We got a few different comments rolling in. Braggs is I, not I wanted soft. to respond to this one. Yes, go so ahead. Chubbs82 says, Braggs is not soft. He's just afraid his worst nightmare is going to come true again. It's the opposite of that. It is that I have so much confidence that this team can go far. At least for me, is that like I'm not worried about the another 16 seats upset. Like I'm just so confident and excited for this potential run for Purdue. Like I don't want a somewhat not meaningless game in the big 10 tournament but a, a not that important game in the big 10 tournament to ruin any chance that we have for it yeah if, of if, course if the bad <laughs> purdue upset happens it happens but well and for clarity chubbs is a good friend of mine oh, who gotcha. over the years okay, yeah. he's an illinois fan who likes to give me crap my and ba my bad, chubbs. no 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 it's fine too uh but i am with you in the confidence of the season and if Braden had been out for the year after that it really would have taken the air a little bit out of entering the NCAA tournament and certainly would have taken a, a hit little. In, yeah, a little bit. Well, I mean, I was, our, as lot. he was in the locker room, I was sitting there already conjuring up, like, will they try to win one for Braden type of, you know, rally cry. <laughs> I mean, but without, you know, he's the engine of this offense. So yep. I think we all understood if he weren't to finish the season, it probably wouldn't end well in a season regards, uh, you know, you know, we got in the chat, Jeremy Armstrong saying the Hummel injuries were brutal. Um, you know, and then somebody also put in the chat that, you know, Braggs believes in curses. Yes. Again, 
as a Cubs fan, I know I always draw the correlation and some people that watch the show don't like when I do this, but I, they, there is a direct correlation to me with this team and the way the Cubs curse was. And, and it does feel like, like, is the moment they finally, the Cubs wanted, it took a special team with a special, special mentality. And they had to overcome some demons, even in their championship run. Rajay Davis hitting a game tying home run in game seven of the world series where, per, where the Cubs Purdue, where the Cubs blow a six to one lead or a five to one lead. And they have to win in extra innings. And it was kind of like this movie type moment for Cubs fans uh, that will live in infamy. And it's probably going to take something like that for Purdue. And I'll never forget when I had to wait in the rain delay for the Cubs to come back in extras to see if they could win it. It was like that final moment in Indiana Jones in the last crusade where he has to cross the bridge to get the cup. And you have to trust that this bridge is in front of you. And it was like that, that final test for Cubs fans. And so for Purdue's sake today in this moment, you know, where they've had injury history and an injury curse attached to their, you know, tournament hopes at times with Robbie Hummel and, you know, um, Isaac Haas, you know, this felt like this next moment. And then all of a sudden, so let's fast forward and spin this into the positive. All of a sudden, Braden reappears onto the court. So we have told our perception of what happened in the moment when he got hurt. What was your reaction when Braden Smith came running back on the court? I'll start with you, Craig. Uh, the the Willis Reed moment, <laughs> right? That's who it was for the Celtics, right? Willis Reed back in the day. I think that was the Knicks, right? Was it the Knicks? Yeah, and I, I don't and, remember. <clears throat> yeah, and Joe's too young to remember, but I, I also think with the Willis Reed thing, well, we're he all didn't... too young to remember. That's <laughs> well. <laughs> That was another old shot at you, Craig. Um, yeah, I yeah, got you. Yeah, well, I uh, and so, but I also think the thing with Willis Reed is he came out for warmups, but he didn't actually play in the game either, right? That's how that story goes. I I'm pretty sure. Did. I don't yeah, know. He did. I think he played Game Seven, and it looks like it was in Madison Square Garden. So I'd have to assume that was the Knicks. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. So all right. So Joe, your your <laughs> it's, I, it's, I never got to give him my okay reaction. all right keep going then I, I thought it was just the willis reed moment go ahead um i wouldn't call it joy so much as a sigh of relief i think i tweeted out the gasp that you just heard across the plains from minneapolis to west lafayette where tens of thousands of purdue fans breathing a sigh of relief and it, it was just like this weight here just vanished just lifted when we saw him come back out and moving okay yeah. And, and I was the same way. It was just like, okay, it, it's, I was, I think when I saw him walking in the back too, um, they, they kind of showed that little bit of clip of him walking on his own and stuff. I was like, okay, he'll probably be fine for at least March the, or for the tourney um, or, or hopefully so. Obviously it's all just speculation at that point, but uh, just, yeah, just kind of some relief. I was shocked. I was surprised to see him go back in. There is like, why is he back in? There is, I guess also the little bit of like, like Painter's not going to put him in if he's not like good to go and he wasn't cleared by medical and all that stuff. So it's like, okay, he, he like, he must be fine. I guess then uh, still just a little scary to see him go back in. And I promise yeah. we're going to get into the breakdown of the game, but I mean, this was the biggest, <laughs> this was yeah. the story of this, the game. This is the breakdown. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, for real though, I mean, it will break down how they won and, and get into some of the stats and stuff, but like, this was the storyline. So for me, I'm producing CHGO Bears from home. We normally do our shows in studio, but on Fridays we're remote. So I'm sitting right here in front of my computer, just like I am now watching the game on my side with my phone on, uh, you know, my direct TV app. And when Braden goes down, I'm producing a show, pulling up the comments, doing everything like we do. And I just have my, my head in my, in my arms. Like I'm like beside myself. I want to throw up, but I'm, literally working i'm on the clock <laughs> and and so for like five minutes pass and i just keep having to glance over at the game and you guys are certainly going to have to carry me when we break down the game but like five minutes go by and i don't even really know when Braden smith checked back in because all i know is when i finally like picked myself up to like look back over at the game Braden is playing defense and i'm like when the hell did he check back in? That was literally for me. Cause like I'm doing, I'm trying to do two things at once. So I didn't even see him check back in. Now I see him on the court. 
I am like just so, so relieved. And then my next instinct was to text you guys and yell at you about why he's still in the game. Cause like, I'm just so relieved that he's, <laughs> he's okay. But like, just sit him, guys, just let him take a dang break. But you know, that's not in their DNA and it speaks to their toughness and their resiliency they've shown all year. So I'm, I'm, I'm not mad. They won. I'm happy. They won. Uh, I'm fine with it, I guess is the right phrasing, but I'm just so relieved and so happy that Braden Smith was able to finish the game and Purdue can, can, tear, can carry on, survive, and advance. So muted. that's that the end. Inst- I was muted. I wanted to yeah. add something really quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I had the, there it is from Chris R says, goodness, the goon squad's coming no matter who wins the next game. Um, and we do have to talk about this specific Purdue MSU game at some point part of just probably like what we do as a show, but um, Purdue's going to play the winner. Allegedly. Of Wisconsin- allegedly. Yeah. Purdue's going to play the winner of Wisconsin Northwestern. We, we remember the Wisconsin senior night game and we remember the Northwestern games so, of uh, Northwestern just fouls in general. So um, just wanted to throw that out there and, and just be like, Hey, it's going to be an, another physical game tomorrow, regardless of who Purdue plays. Well, thanks for making everybody worried for the next 24 hours. <laughs> we, we appreciate that. You know what, yeah, after, no after making it, you know, after making it through this one where everyone is uh, apparently healthy, uh, I think we'll, we'll take whatever we can get and, and we'll have to just keep monitoring the rotation. So uh, um, we'll take a break and, and then on the back end, we'll, we'll when we come back, we'll, uh, you know, talk about the game itself and, and get into some of the X's and O's with Joe and, and uh, in some of the statistical breakdown here. Uh, and, and these guys always do a great job breaking down the game. So looking forward to that. But before we do certainly want to give a shout out here to autograph. So, yeah, I mean, we've been, we've been talking about autograph for a few weeks at this point now, um, but for anybody that doesn't know, it is a cool app that has all of your Purdue sports coverage in one specific spot. i um, not only just Purdue, but whatever kind of college teams you want, they're going to continue adding more college teams, eventually maybe pro teams. Um, so all the content you consume, right, whether it be our podcast or Black and Gold or Boiler Upload or Hammer and Rails, you know, the list goes on and on. We, we just recently somebody put out a list of all like the, the different platforms for Purdue. And there's so many good ones out there. Um, you can find like all that stuff on this app and then Autograph rewards you for it. There's like interactive leaderboards to see who interacts with stuff the most. They give out really, really good ticket deals. Um, they're, they're having stuff come up for March Madness. They had tickets for the Big Ten Championship. Um, where it's and, and the was Purdue Wisconsin game, Purdue MSU game, they had those where the ticket package is um, basically ends up being sixteen dollars a ticket. Which for anybody that has looked at ticket prices, unreal deal. It is completely free. Use code bits. You log on and then just consume the contents you already do. Um, and now you get you get rewarded to do it. So we are happy to be uh, partnered with them. No doubt. Um, and, and again, it's an app that I use daily, uh, one that I absolutely love, love to consume the content on there that I'm already consuming. Uh, I don't need the tickets. Well, not yet. We'll see. One of us might need tickets in the next couple of weeks. But um, nonetheless, uh, $16 tickets for the first round of the Big Ten t- or of the NCAA tournament starting real soon. Um, so certainly get on there. Use the code BITS. And watch yourself climb up the leaderboard as you consume content and get rewards for awesome ticket deals. Yeah, hundred percent. So once again, uh, make sure you're hitting the the QR code that you see here on the screen. Um, and uh, as these guys mentioned, uh, always when you do use the promo code Bits when you sign up at Autograph. It's available, you know, for Android as well. They just recently became available on Android, so you download the app. You know, use this QR code, it'll get you there. And once again, use the promo code BITS when you sign up. All right, guys, uh, as we roll into the breakdown of this game, now that we got our feelings out of the way, uh, and I think that's very appropriate, um, you know, just the start of March and and really just digging at the heartstrings here of Purdue uh, Boilermaker basketball fans. And uh, But now we're going to get into the X's and O's and the breakdown of how they won this game and, and as they continue their journey through March madness. So uh, where, where, where exactly do you guys want to start with this? Well, we have to, right? It, it, we have to start with Zach Eady in this, right? Yeah. 29 no points, 12 rebounds, four assists, two blocks, two turnovers, 35 minutes. 
10 of 16 from the field, 9 of 14 from the line. Zach Eady does Zach Eady things. And the, the thing I wanted to point out, especially this time and, and early on too, right? We know that Purdue's going to, or Purdue's going to feed Eady and Eady's going to get his against MSU. He's absolutely torched them the last four games, right? That's just with how MSU has played. I mean, they did, MSU did eventually adjust a little bit how they were playing defense, but for the most part, single coverage and, and just live with what Eady can give you. Some of the catches Eady was making early in the game to get to his post ups were wild. Like they are not. Like when we talk about Purdue in general, they're a very good post entry passing team, right? You have to if if this is the offense you're going to run. A lot of those early on, I think MSU just being a little bit physical. Those were some weird angles, some not good passes, and I think Edie caught every one. I don't remember one really. Maybe he had one that kind of slipped somewhere in the game. Um, like it was, it, it didn't matter. He had to reach way up high, down low, on the move. Like it didn't really matter over over people. Like. Um, Cohen Carr comes flying in. He's going to catch it over. Like he, his hands are just so good. And yes, he's seven, four and two ninety 290 pounds and has great touch and all that, like, and, and footwork and like, but his hands are just so good. Like you can, you can just kind of chuck it at him. And more often than not, he's going to catch the ball. Um, and then once he catches it one-on-one -on -one coverage for the most part of this game, and then he's going to go up and score. Now, Miss, you did eventually start doubling a little bit. Um, per Edie only had two turnovers in this game. And I think. I think both came somewhat late in the game. I don't quite remember. Um, but yeah, just, just what he does there. And then also defensively, it's um, here, let's see. Like just yeah, his, his I mean, Michigan State shot 39.3%. A lot, not all of it is ED, right? Uh, so you couldn't buy a bucket at times. Um, and just especially at the Ram three, but just his presence. We we talk about it and, and we just need to hit on it. I think every almost every game. It's like teams, especially an MSU team. They're going to get to their mid range and Edie's going to force it. Like uh, when, if Edie isn't guarding Booker today, which I don't think he really did except for the last play or whatever, um, he's not going to, he's not going to be moved by any of the Michigan state centers. And so he's going to live with whatever they want to do anywhere. That's not exactly at the rim. Um, and even then it's not like they get a ton of respect there. So uh, just anchoring the defense and, and the hands were the two things I really wanted to shout out with him today. Yeah, and he had uh, four assists uh, to yep. those two turnovers today. So it's seven foot four, a uh, two to one um, assist to turnover ratio. So you have to love that. And, and just in terms of the defense, you saw multiple times today where Walker got into that like five to six foot range and he takes that shot against anybody else. Um, and he just peeled back or pivoted and passed it back out. Um, just, just wasn't attacking from that mid range near as much as he normally does because you know, Edie would step up one or two feet. And Walker's not the biggest guy in the world. And even at that range, you know, a potential block from that situation. So I saw quite a few people just in general as we talked maybe about team defense just a little bit about Michigan State getting really good looks and just missing them in the first half. And they did get probably four pretty wide open looks from three. Um, every team's going to get a couple along the way somewhere. Those I obviously came pretty early in the game and relatively successively. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, a lot of those open looks were the looks that Purdue tries to force teams into. So uh, a lot of those open looks were that mid range, 10 to 15 foot jump shot that most teams just don't hit very successfully. Um, even if they've got a fairly clean look at it and you saw Michigan state miss those over and over again today for the most part. Um, you know, I thought Walker looked like he had a little bit more bounce in his step over the last few games than maybe he did earlier in the season. I know he's been battling some just kind of nagging injuries throughout, but he just never really got going today. Shoots, I think, 33% on the day, 6 of 18. Yep. Um, 3 of 7 from, from 3, so decent from there, but just never really got going at the rim or in his mid-range whatsoever. Yeah, and... There was, there was definitely moments where Purdue's defense was very good. Um, there was also, yeah, I just think there were moments where MSU got decent looks and just even missed. And even even just some stuff at the rim, too. Like, it was just like little four-footers. Now, Zach Eady being there does affect things a lot. Um, but even though it's just, just missed a few. Um, but Purdue, this is, a, you know, goes back to where Purdue, you said at the top, Purdue played maybe their C game today, maybe. Um, and they figured it out anyways right they, they still get the win they get a big enough lead early on they did miss they were never trailing in the second half right i don't no, think no no they trailed this game for 29 seconds and that's when uh msu was up three to two like purdue still controlled this entire game in terms of the lead 
Um, and so credit to them for being able to do that, regardless of what was going on with injuries and, and all of that stuff. So um, that, that's just that's a good thing to see go into March is like they can have off nights and still figure it out. Yeah, no doubt. And I, I don't know exactly where you want to go next. I, I know where I want to go next. Go for um, it. While we're talking about defense, I think we've we've got to give Lance Joan props today. Yes. Um, he draws four offensive fouls in that first half, draws one more uh, towards the end of the game. So I think he draws five offensive fouls on the day. There was at least one in there that I thought, I think it was Aikens drove against him that I thought was probably the wrong call. I The more I looked at the Hall one, it does look like Hall kind of dips his shoulder and yeah, Lance sells it, but it was there. Uh, we've seen enough people pull that off time and time again. So I thought Lance was really, really good defensively today. And and whether they were missing open shots or whether it was decent defense, uh, none of the guards, Aikens finishes 2 of 11, Walker finishes 6 of 18, Hogard 3 of 8. None of those guys hit 50% on the day. Um, so I, I thought, not that Lance was guarding all three of them, but I thought Lance did a really, really nice job today, um, whether it was drawing fouls, um, whether it was just applying good defense and, and making shots tough by and large. And that's just, you know, when we talk about this team relative to last year, um, especially today, because a lot of the commentary has been, well, you know, Braden's a year older and he's so much better this year than last year, but Braden wasn't on the court for long stretches. And then when he did come back in, he didn't have the same pop or same flow in this game as what he normally would have. Not at all. So, Lance didn't necessarily replace Braden from a scoring standpoint or assist standpoint, but it's just adding that different element. We didn't have anybody that was getting in front of guards, quick guards, quick athletic guards like Michigan State has last year. We just didn't. We, you know, we didn't have that dude um, that could get those. And in a game that ends up being a five point game, getting the ball back five more times, right? We force. 13 turnovers on Michigan State. Five of those were Lance Jones drawn for offensive fouls. Yep. No, I, I I'm glad you went there because he was probably the most he was probably the second best player on the floor tonight for Purdue. Um, just with what he did defensively, he didn't end up shooting a great percentage, but early on, especially, he was really aggressive. Um, and then it did fall off a little bit from there as he's kind of tasked with more. And that's where it just goes back to like they they Purdue figured it out a little bit today. It was just more of hey, we're going to clamp defensively and try to just force feed the ball to Edie. Um, but when Brain Smith's off the floor, it's just it is a different look. But with Lance Jones playing that type of defense, that makes it a little bit easier to manage those minutes of just like yeah, we're probably not going to score quite as much, but they're also just not going to score a lot. So kind of cancels out. Um, yeah, just really good job on, on on pretty much whoever he was guarding for most of the time. Obviously, he got beat a few times and whatever, but in position a lot of the game. Um, and Purdue, Purdue definitely does not win this game without him uh, and, and what he did defensively. There's just no doubt in my mind. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, as we kind of peruse through team stats, um, you know, some things are relatively interesting in terms of what jumps out, right? So this is the second time all year Purdue gets beat in rebounds. Uh, Michigan State finishes with 37. Purdue finishes with 36. They also get beat in offensive rebound. Michigan State finishes with 14 and Purdue finishes with 12. And then you look at fast break points. And, you know, Joe, I know in the in the regular season matchup, the very first thing we said on our, our key, like, keys to the game was you have to stop MSU in transition. And a lot of those aren't true transition. Those aren't, like, getting out in transition off live ball turnovers. It's transition off a of miss. They're just going to push immediately. They got one super quick with a kick straight down to Tyson Walker in the yep. corner. And then they did it repeatedly, much more than they did in the regular season game. They did it more and more. And I think they finished, yeah, they finished with 18 fast break points today. Purdue finishes with zero. There's a lot of things on the team stat sheet that if you look through this, you're like, how how did Purdue win? Um, yeah. And really, I mean, a decent amount of that is it. we, we shoot 36% from three compared to Michigan State's 22%. Some of it's the free throw differential, uh, making eight more free throws, and some of it is Lance stealing those possessions, man. Right, uh, because like we talk about so many times, I've said it many times here on this show all season long, you have to pitch a perfect game to beat Purdue, which means you have to play great, and you also, within that perfect game, you also need Purdue to play bad. And so if you don't have both of those factors in there, so Purdue didn't necessarily play bad 
They didn't play great, but you know, Michigan state didn't pitch a perfect game, 13 turnovers. You know, that's not going to get the job done. You can't have 13 turnovers. If you're trying to win, you go four of 18 from three, 22% from three. You can't, you know, if you're going to beat Purdue, you know, we saw with Nebraska and Northwestern, I mean, they were, they were literally unconscious from three point land. And, yeah. and then that also added with Purdue had the turnovers mounting up. Purdue only had uh, 11 turnovers on the day. So that's, that's right around where they want to be. So, you know, in that regard, you know, um, they, they just didn't do enough. I mean, Purdue almost let them back in it with the free throws in the second half, but um, you know, you got to have, you got to check a lot of boxes on this, on this, on the stats to, uh, to have a, even a shot. I mean, cause even if you have all these things go your way, Purdue's still going to take you down to the wire more times than not. Yeah. 100%. And this is, it goes back to like, I think, like realistically, MSU probably should have won this game. They they really should have. Um, and it just came down to at the end of the day, they weren't able to make the plays. Purdue has Zach Eady, who was you know twenty nine points tonight. He was pretty much just a cheat code down low, as he has been against MSU. Um, MSU didn't have that guy. Tyson Walker can be it at times. He wasn't efficient. Um, Malik Hall was fine. He was solid at moments for sure, um, but it wasn't like he had one of those like takeover games. And so nobody for MSU's offense was able to come through in a way that was able to match what Edie does. Um, and so when it turns into this defensive game, if Edie is going to put up 29 on efficient shooting, like it's going to be hard to overcome that regardless of what Purdue's doing. And on top of that, Purdue didn't shoot abysmal from three, right? It wasn't, I mean, five for 14 is below their average, which uh, if we think back to last year, if we pretty would have taken five for 14 every single game, but Purdue doesn't shoot bad from three. They win the turnover battle, um, and then nobody can match what Edie can do offensively. When you get that combined with some pretty good defense, like it's going to be tough to beat Purdue. MSU almost did it, but Purdue get Purdue got the things that they needed when it had mattered the most. So they got a couple stops late when it really mattered. Um, a couple of them were just MSU misses. A couple of them really good defense from Purdue. Um, Fletcher Lawyer knocks down a huge three in the corner after he's been kind of struggling all game on the offensive end. Um, you knock down enough free throws. Like you just, they did enough. They have good fights. And, and regardless of what fans thoughts are on the big 10 tournaments, like this team wants to win. This team wants to win every game. They, they want to win the big 10 regular season. They did. They dominated. They want to win the big 10 tournament and then they want to go win the national championship. So that way when it's all said and done, they can look back and be like, yeah, we did everything we had to do this year. Um, and this is step one of step one of part two, I guess, for that of, you win two more, you win the Big Ten tournaments, and then you move on to March and see what happens there. Yeah, and I, you know, really, I thought Purdue answered some questions with Smith off the floor. Um, we, we've had to play some games with Edie off the floor, but we really haven't seen much at all this year when it's like, okay, Braden's got to sit because of fouls. And then Braden goes out with the injury. And in that time, I'm pretty sure by the time the game was done, I know you did the on-off split in the first half, but I think over both halves, Purdue was actually net positive in this one particular game um, with Smith off the floor. Um, yeah. Plus four with him off plus one with him on. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of people that think Purdue can't win. If either one of those two guys has to go to the bench for whatever reason, and they've kind of answered that bell time and time again, and they answered it again today. Um, they do it in different ways. The team looks completely different in terms of how they run their offense but they were still able to manufacture enough offense uh, in, in those minutes off. And they played some really good defense in those minutes off too. So uh, without a doubt, we want Braden Smith on the floor, but it's not a terrible thing as long as he's healthy, uh, you know, and good to go. It's not a terrible thing that, that Braden didn't have to play a ton of minutes. And this team figured out ways that they can get things done with Braden, not in the game. I'm looking through and I don't think the entire season, in a non-blowout game, right? So the bye games and then like the Penn State first Michigan game, uh, Rutgers game at home. So taking out those bye games, I don't think Brayden has played less than 35 minutes in any like meaningful game. Um, he played 33 against Xavier, the third game of the year, which Purdue was dominated and controlled pretty much close to the way, even though they only win by 12. Like, So Brayden goes from not having played under 35 to he played 26 today, going back to the point of Purdue hasn't had to play without him. Um, and I think it is 
when he's off the floor, Edie has to be on the floor. That's going to be your main source of offense. Yep. And then it's it's really important that the defense is there in those minutes, I think. Um, so just try Brian, not to give up a ton of ton of separation at that moment. So Brian Bennett here in the chat says Purdue took only 53 shots compared to 61 by MSU. Purdue took 27 free throws to only 12 by MSU. Won another game at the foul line, even though the percentage was low. So in terms of pace of play, because like what was the final score? I mean, it was certainly below their average by a wide margin, right, Joe? 62 to 67, and they were um well, they averaging in the 80s right on the season no like 72 percent on the season i think not not this percent. was this was I'm, Purdue's uh third worst offensive performance of the season in terms of points per possession right oh. so, well what about i thought you were talking about the free throw line percentage no 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 no, no. i'm sorry i was He's talking, talking about, about point, point, yeah offensive production points per like what are they averaging points per game on the year it's like one point one eight, one point one nine, one point two. They was they were at like one point oh this game. Listen here, Mister Little Numbers. I'm talking. What do they average? Oh, points per game uh, on this season, like 82, 83. something like that. I one... truly could not tell you. I'll look okay. it up. But well, it's not something what do, track what, do, what do we have you here for, Joe? No, I'm kidding. I, I, I'm certain well, it's probably in the low 80s, right? I mean, regardless, eighty four point two, eighty four point two points per game. They have sixty three points on the game, so. Joe, from your standpoint, like you said, third worst offensive efficiency or or performance of the year, you know, and they still win. So it, it goes because they're going to have to win a, a a bevy of different ways if they want to get all the way to the final four and, and win a national championship. So does it encourage you that they won a game like this or does it concern you how much the game was slowed down now that we're in tur tournament play? No, I, I think it's a good like for me. It's it's more positive. Of this was a game where MSU controlled a lot of the pace, um, and then you have we're called to call it what it is. There was like a six minute stretch where Purdue was just like, is yeah. our, like is Braden Smith done? Like, and it, that's what it really looked like on the floor um, to some extent. You have that. You are not you're shooting lights out from three. You really don't have much offensive production besides Edie, and they still find a way to win. Um, that that's big time to me because they've like, I know that at the end of the day, all that had, all that matters at the, from this point forward, especially is what happens in those six games in March, right? Like what happens when you look at what this season is, like we can go through and, and as we're worried about 16 seeds, they have to show up and they have to play there. I'm not taking that away. It has to happen. There's no guarantee that happens, but you look like. Look at all their bye games. They beat Sanford, who's going to be a, a good 13 seed. They beat them by 53 to open up the season. Moorhead State, 30. Texas Southern, 32. Jacksonville, 30. Eastern Kentucky, 33. Like they dominate these bad teams. And then when you get into Big Ten play, they can, you know, they can have a shootout like against Northwestern at home where they went 105 to 96 in overtime. They can beat MSU on a neutral floor where they're not getting much on, of anything on offense, 67 to 62, where MSU probably controlled a lot of the pace. They can grind games down against Illinois where it's a game where teams want to really run or they can go out and run and, and drop 95 against Penn State or, or whatever it is like. They've shown whatever they are going up against. They have the capability of beating. They, they have the pieces we haven't seen a game except for probably one, maybe two. Really, the only game is probably Ohio State where it's like you had multiple guys not show up and it hurt Purdue. Usually you you have enough and, and the right guys step up at the right time, centered around Zach Eady. Obviously makes it a little bit easier, but um, this is just another, another kind of check mark of like they just can win different ways. It has to happen in March, but I, they've shown that they can do it. However, it needs to happen. No doubt, no doubt. And and can do it with different people. Okay. One of the things we've talked about all year is there's been a lot of debate about the rotation. And Joe, I think you and I completely tend to land on the thought process that yeah, within any specific game, he may only play eight guys. Uh, but who those eight guys are in terms of who gets a little bit more extended run can very much change just based upon what Purdue needs in that specific time against that specific matchup. Today he had to go 10 deep because of some early foul trouble. Um, and he played all 10 guys um, that would get minutes potentially uh, from one of those rotations. And I think the next guy we need to talk about a little bit today is Miles Colvin, to be 100%. honest. 100%. And his, his minutes in the first half today were really good. And it wasn't 
earlier in the season, we said Miles Colvin's minutes were really good because he did good things offensively and we could hide him defensively. He played good defensive stretches today as well. I think he ends up, uh, in terms of defensive rebounds, he ends up with uh, uh, just two. It felt like he got more than that. It seemed like I saw him with a couple of different box outs. Maybe other guys grabbed the rebound when he did. Um, but but played good enough defense one-on-one uh, against guards that were trying to break him down. He gets that slip for the dunk. He misses the three, not particularly well shot on his first attempt, but then comes right back on that next possession, I think, and shoots that pull-up 18-footer with a hand in his face and just drills it. Um, gets to the free throw line another time on a nice move and ends up getting uh, hitting one one from there. So it doesn't look like a ton, only five points and two rebounds, uh, but in a critical stretch when Braden goes to the bench and when you've got a couple other guys in foul trouble too, I think Heidi got in a little bit early foul trouble too, yep. and he has to come in. You're saying, okay, well, we've only seen a few stretches here in the last month or two, so month and a half or so. So what's he going to do? Uh, what's he going to provide? And he showed that he can step up against a pretty good team in Michigan State. Yeah, and it's, for me, I've not, I don't want to say never cared about the offensive production, right? The shooting, like he can hit shots. It's what he can do. Purdue has plenty of guys. Like when when you look at, he's when he's on the floor, right? Let's say it's Braden, Lance, Colvin, Gillis, Edie. Colvin's like the fourth or fifth option offensively. In terms of scoring the ball, so it's that's never been the thing with me. It's the little things. It's what is your defense looking like, and it hasn't been good for large chunks. That said, this was his best half of basketball since Bama. I, I'm pretty confident in saying that. Like he pl- he did the right things for the most part defensively. Yes, mistakes one or two, whatever. Like everybody has those. I'm, I'm not going to hold those against him. He, I, you saw a couple post entry passes into Edie that were good. You saw him attack the boards a little bit, and then you also did see the pull up. But the pull-up and the shot making for me, in terms of consistent minutes, that's like last on the totem pole for me right now. Now, maybe there is a game in March, like a Sweet 16 game or whatever, and it's Purdue has nothing, and he absolutely can come in and drill a couple threes. I'm I'm not not taking that away. Um, But for me, it's just it's the I need to see the little things, and I I saw those today. Um, I, I think Wisconsin was a tougher matchup with he just came in off the bench and had to guard AJ Store. He had some good moments, also some bad moments against Store there, but um, it's a good sign that he did what he needed to today, um, doing the, some more of the little things because that's that's what's going to be needed. And, and if he is going to be called on for you know six to ten minutes a game more consistently, it's those little things that are going to be the big things for him. No, but well, this is a type of team that he can play defensively well against in my mind because a yeah. lot of Michigan State's action is going to be in terms of what Purdue guards need to do, it's keep Aikens in front of you, keep Hogard in front of you, keep uh, Walker in front of you with not a lot of really advanced action, right? He's not sure. defending the Princeton offense with a bunch of back cuts in terms of all having to have your head on a swivel. And athletically, he's shown he's capable of kind of that one-on-one yep. defense and keeping his guy in front of him and all that sort of stuff. We may play some teams that run a lot of back cuts and do some crazy action um, that is much harder from a a defensive rotation standpoint than a Michigan State, and that may not play into it quite as well. But I think as we get into the NCAA tourney, um, (laughs) some of those teams that we might play in the SEC, in the Big 12, uh, those sort of teams also kind of lend themselves to this type of team in terms of what Miles can do well defensively. So I'm still not going to be shocked if we see Miles get a stretch of 10 minutes, 15 minutes in an NCAA game at some point. It's just going to depend on on who Painter needs to ride at that specific time. Yeah, Matt Spurgeon here adding in the chat. Colvin has got so much more offensive game that he'll be allowed to unleash as he polishes it up. 100%. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's a great shooter. He's got, you know... You know, a lot of athleticism, obviously, um, you know, got good length, you know, he, he can crash the glass, you know, there's a lot of different things he can, he's got a lot of potential um, beyond just his shooting ability. Uh, so yeah, we actually just got a super chat in here from Ryan Lewis. He said $10 super chat donation for blood pressure meds for everyone. So we appreciate Ryan uh, kicking us a super chat uh, for those of you that don't know, or, or possibly are new to the show. Like, We've had a lot of different people reach out to us and ask how they can help, you know, um, you know, donate to the cause here of what we're doing here at Boilers in the Stands. So 
uh, we've, we've figured out one avenue that you can do that. If, if you enjoy what you're watching and, and, and the content we're putting out there and you want to throw, throw some love our way, uh, we always appreciate everyone's support. We appreciate everybody tuning in, uh, in general, and please hit that like button while you're here, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you're watching on Facebook or Twitter, we appreciate you. Uh, but it does us a big favor if you head over to uh, the Brags in the Stands overhead channel on our YouTube and you'll see the whole Boilers in the Stands library within there. I cover a lot of Chicago sports along in there as well, uh, but we do a lot of different things. So uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the like button on the show. Those are the kind of things that are going to help you know push the algorithm on YouTube to some people that may not know of us quite yet. So, uh, Ryan, appreciate the super chat donation. And once again, we appreciate everyone tuning in, in here today to Boilers in the Stands. That was a really, really good breakdown of Miles Colvin um, by you two. You guys certainly cont- continue to carry the load here at Boilers in the Stands. And uh, it's a lot of fun hearing your guys' analysis of the game. Uh, I'm excited tomorrow to be able to watch, you know, Purdue versus whether it's Northwestern or Wisconsin with uh, no distractions, no, no uh, CHGO uh, commitments and producing or whatever I got to do right now. Northwestern's up 23 to 12 with around 11 minutes to play in the first I'm half of you. Spoiler, uh, yeah. Wisconsin, Wisconsin scores. Okay, cool. See, you could have, you could have started betting me from here on out and, uh, and won a bunch of bets. Um, so yeah, I'm a little delayed cause I'm on the app on my phone, but a uh, bit of physical game here for these guys as well. I mean, that's how the Big Ten is. No surprise there. So uh, whoever they end up with, as we talked about earlier, is going to bring a physicality uh, tomorrow too. So, you know, that's just another one of those reasons where <laughs> we're not like, you know, we wouldn't, it, it was, it's a win-win. Bobby said, Bobby Riddell said it, you know, the play-by-play guy for Purdue Men's Basketball Radio when he was on our show last week. It's a win-win. <clears throat> However, this shakes out. If they had lost today, we could rationalize it and say, okay, you got your loss out of the way. You, you Now you have extra days of rest. Uh, if you win, you can also say, hey, that's great. They, they learned how to win a close game or not learned how to win, but they proved they could win this type of game in March and, you know, check that box. So, you know, either way, you're going to find your rationalization, even if they get all the way to Sunday and they're in the championship game. If they win it, great. Hoist the trophy. Have some fun. Another, uh, you know, another add another trophy to the to the case at Mackey Arena. But if they're to lose the championship on Sunday, then my rationalization will immediately go to, well, they got one out of the way. You know what I mean? Like just from a law of averages perspective, which I do believe in, in basketball that or at all sports, but really basketball in a big way. Um, it, 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 I do think there holds some credence to that. The last time Purdue lost was against Ohio state. So if they're not to lose the rest of the year, sign me up. But you know, the basketball gods aren't always as kind uh, in that regard. So, you know, we'll just yeah. have to see how it plays out. But what I'm trying to say, long story short, with one of my, you know, um, rants, as I always do, I mean, Craig went all the way uh, to a bathroom break and back with me <laughs> on on a five minute rant about um, it being a win win. So I'll let you guys get back to the analysis. Yeah. And I, and I will say, because I think there is just so much talk about what is, you know, what does this Big Ten tournament really mean? And, It is what it is. It's something that they have to do. Um, There's also like, and we goes back to our show with Anton Sony, right? Trends are trends until they're not. But I believe it's every single, since the tournament expanded in 1985, um, every team has won it. Every team that's won the national championship has won their first round of their conference tournament. Um, There's also the whole, like the big 10, the team that wins the Big Ten tournament has an advance out of the, the first weekend since like 2019 or something like that. Um, so there, there's all these, you know, trends that hold some weight. It's a little different with especially with Big Ten just being so late. Um, cause, and then there's also just like to me, it's it's if you make it to the championship. Right. To me. And I know and not that I'm rooting for them to lose, but if there was a <laughs> loss, tomorrow would be the one to lose where it's OK. You get that first win and you're going to play two games. You're not going to be fully rusty, like have a two week break. Um, but then you do get that extra day of rest. If you make the tournament to me, it's just go ahead and win it. Like, why not at that point? Um, but yeah, there's just all these things. And then the other thing that I wanted to bring up 
was it was in the comments and i should have had david jenkins ready. in the chat says 2024 is the year that all of those trends are broken i uh, love it love it david i can't i can't find the comments i thought i had it start i must have oh there it is from, from matt spurgeon he said what's the last team to win both regular season and tourney two years in a row and i think they said on the broadcast that it was the 1999 2000 michigan state teams and you know what michigan uh michigan state did is i remember that they year won the well championship. They won they, the they, they won the whole and they're, thing, and they're the last Big Ten team to win the national championship. Yep. Correct, Mateen, Mate, yep. Mateen Cleves. That was um, I remember that that um, March Madness fondly. Mateen went on a big time run there for Michigan State. Yep. So like you, as much as like the current trend is the Big Ten tournament winner hasn't advanced. Michigan State, who is the team that's won it last, has shown like, hey, a long time ago it can happen. Also. Well, because you know what it is, because you know, because you know what it is, if they win the regular season championship and the Big Ten tournament championship back to back years, just like Michigan State did in 99, 2000, you know what that is? They're winners. That's what that means. They're winners. And when and and because they lost to Fairleigh Dickinson, there's people around the country that think they're losers. No, that was the anomaly. They're winners Uh, there. And 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 being able to win back to back regular season Big Ten championships, having the most Big Ten championships in conference tournament history, starting to extend that margin, and, and an opportunity to win back-to-back Big Ten tournament championships just you know highlights the point of the program that Matt Painter's built and the winners they have in that locker room right now. You know, and 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 Zach Eady is a winner. He's one of the most dominant winners in Purdue basketball history. This senior class are winners. They have one of the best resumes of any senior class in Big Ten history. And so that's who these guys are. They're winners. And while last year in March against Fairleigh Dickinson hurt and sucked, um, that was the anomaly. And Zach Eady came back last year or said, let's run it back this year for a reason, to get back to this point and prove that that was the anomaly and go on a run. And I have all the confidence in the world as long as these guys go into March healthy, that they're going to be able to climb the mountain once and for all. Yeah, Boo Boo, he just went to the yeah. bench with a lower body injury, and I'm officially at Screw the Big Ten Tourney mode right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, and they've had injuries. You know, they they yeah. lost um, – <clears throat> who'd they lose on the year? Um, yeah, Ma- yeah, Ty Berry, and I almost said Matthew Berry because I cannot stop thinking about football, but, um, you know – well, Matt you know, Nicholson's yeah. also been hurt. I, I yeah, have, Matt I've Nicholson. Been glancing, I haven't seen if he's been in or not. But and Ty Berry was a huge miss for them. So then now Boo Booey goes down. So they if, they've certainly been riddled with injury. If Purdue no. plays Northwestern, like Ty Berry, I think in his two games was like a combined like ten of fourteen or ten of fifteen from three in those two games. Well, when um, you when we talked with Brian Tonsoni yeah. the other day talking about Nick- the bracketology. I, that was something I never realized. This rule, if you've played a team three times, right, or is it even twice? If you play twice. a team twice, that you cannot play them until the second weekend. Like I yeah. had, I had never knew that rule, and that's the great thing about Brian Tonsoni from Delphi Bracketology and a great friend of this show is when we bring him on. Almost always, I learn something new about the sport that I've been watching my whole life with college basketball. So that was certainly something interesting. I took note of. Yeah. Nicholson has not played this game yet. Yeah. Just saw, yeah. Yeah. And then even right. with, cause Nebraska is also in that eight, nine area. Um, I think they would try to avoid that if possible. Yep. But that one's and, like, since Purdue's only played them once, I think it's still like allowed. They just try not to yeah. have that. If first they would match up. If they would meet in the championship after Ohio state upsets True. Illinois today, Potentially, though, that could end up being that way. So, you can't um, take Ohio State to beat Illinois and have them lose to Nebraska. Yeah, <laughs> I did. That's what. That's what there. was my prediction at the very beginning of this: that Ohio State beats Iowa, beats Illinois, and then loses to Nebraska. So, I'll say this much: Scott White in the chat saying, "I still cringe when I hear Fairly Dickinson." I understand why. Trust me, I get it. Uh, it's. It's a gut punch every time you hear St. Peter's or Fairleigh Dickinson or North Texas. But just like I said earlier, when you've got some curses, when you got the elephant in the room, 
the worst thing you can do is pretend like the elephant isn't standing there. And what I love about this team and why they do feel a little different, which isn't a guarantee in March, but why they feel a little different, not only is the consistency in which they play week game to game and the resiliency and toughness and maturity they've shown, the other thing that I have taken note of is Matt Painter, Zach Eady, and Braden Smith aren't afraid to face that elephant in the room and address the failures that are behind them and they've got their eyes on what's in front of them, but they're not pretending like, Hey, we, we can't talk about this. We're too scared to acknowledge the elephant in the room. No, they're looking at all dead in the face. And these guys have a little bit of a killer mentality and a little bit of toughness. We saw here at the end of the game, when Braden got hurt, he comes back in, you know, Mason Gillis and Zach Eady, when Fletcher Lawyer, you know, hit the deck, we saw these guys getting into it with Michigan State. Zach Eady throwing a little shove, like, get off my guy. And so there's a chippiness with these guys. There's a little bit of an edge and a fire, you know, with these guys, where last year, I think when a team threw a punch, they didn't always handle that punch well. This team, they have had some punches thrown their way, and they throw a few back. You know, and, yep. and we've seen it from start to finish here this year uh, at the Arizona game that they that was two heavyweight boxers throwing haymakers and Braden Smith just kept coming. Fletcher Lawyer just kept coming. Zach Yeadie's always coming. So, you know, that's what I love about these guys. They, they, they don't stop, you know, and they're not they, they're not afraid of the moment. Uh, last year, I, I I would have argued at times they were afraid of the moment, but these guys they don't they they haven't shown that one time all year, and that's even in this game specifically. And I know this is much much lower stakes than than March, right? But I've, I'll bring it up again. Lawyer did not have a good game. I don't think he played that well. He knocks down a big time three, even though he struggled um, late in the game. Gillis, who in the first half was whatever, he only he was zero for one from three um, in terms of the, of the scoring output. Late in the game, he knocks down a couple threes. Like this is where last year, like in my head, I, I got I got a little bit of the flashback of like, oh, this is kind of FDU again. They're just and part of it was that brain smith injury. They're they're hesitant, they're just like uh, out there. Um, Gillis knocks down two threes in confidence. Lawyer knocks down a big time three. Uh, it's just yeah, I'm 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 with you there. Like this team just they just they just feel different. Um, even just like the chippiness, right? Zach Eady gets a technical, um, and maybe a little bit of a soft one with the double tech, whatever. But um, there's just, there is that little bit of edge to them that they're not going to back down to anybody. Um, also side note that Holloman ED thing was hilarious with Holloman, like <laughs> stepping up to ED and just, Oh like, yeah. Zach, him down yeah. And just look straight up. And Zach's just laughing at him, you know, yep. like, all right, all right, little, little guy, everybody's a little guy to Zach, even, yeah, true. you know, the tallest guys. <laughs> That's true. And these, I mean, some of the like comparison to the FDU game you were saying you got a little bit of flashback today was, I, I mean, Michigan State, the way they've played Purdue the last four or five games is just, you know, it, it, it's the way their defense plays Purdue, it sets up for we're going to feed the ball to Zach 40 times. And because, you know, Zach is generally going to score on Michigan State. And Carter Elliott has spoke about Michigan State's big men at length and about his willingness to trade for anybody um, on Purdue's bench whatsoever that plays in the post. Um, and it's just not a good matchup for them. So it's going to be a lot, a lot of Zach by design uh, without as many threes. Somebody said something about, you know, why didn't Fletch let the ball go a little bit more? Well, you know, Zach shoots 10 to 16 and probably could have been 12 to 16 today um, against Michigan State. If a couple more just kind of drop in that were pretty point blank range, that's just the way Mitch, you know, Painter talks all the time about you take what the defense give you gives you. Um, they did a pretty nice job of shutting Fletcher and Lance off, I thought, from three for the most part today um, and, and tried to force everything into Zach, and Zach went ahead and beat him. And there's also but, the, like, when we think of what Michigan State did, Michigan State, the, the reason they almost won was transition. And so I think unless – I, I don't know. I'm just speculating, but like, unless you're wide open, if you can get the ball down to Zach, that's going to allow the guards to get back a little bit quicker. It's also not going to be a long rebound, right? Uh, if a miss three is going to usually have the long bounce, long rebound and Michigan state's already running then. Um, so I think there's also that aspect too, of just like, you can throw it into Edie, who's probably going to score. And then if he does miss, you're hopefully going to be a little bit better set um, than, than, you know, a long three pointer of getting back in defense. Obviously if you're wide open, shoot it and, and 
they still knocked down, you know, still took 14 threes. But um, I, I think that's also a little bit of it as well. Yeah, Gillis was really the only one today that I thought passed up one or two that he could have gone ahead and fired the trigger on. Um, <clears throat> but but he, I, yeah. I think both of those times that I'm thinking of in my head, he shot fakes, throws it down to Zach, and Zach scores. So, yep. you know, um, even if it's a good shot, sometimes there's a better shot. 100%. 100%. Hundred percent. Look at we're Whoa. all. Whoa! I know. Yeah, that's called chemistry, ladies and gentlemen. You're not just getting it with the basketball team we all love. You're getting it here at Boilers in the Stands. Uh, we've got great chemistry here, and we appreciate everybody hanging out. Once again, hit that like button while you're hanging out. Subscribe to the channel. Do all that stuff that we tell you so many times here on this show to show us some love. We appreciate all of it. We love you guys for chilling with us so uh do we have uh any more uh breaks we got to take before we uh round third here on the show just no, wanted to I make think sure we can, there's there's no more ad reads i think okay. we can pretty much game ball this puppy out and before we go to game ball there's one thing i, I have to have to hit on is uh ethan Morton just drills a pull up yep confident drilled it and there might not be much more to talk about than that, but it's just like, <laughs> it's one of those just like, that was, that was clean. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to throw it out because was that in the first half or he had a, he had a bucket in the second half too, right? No, I think no. the first half. No, he just had that pull up. Yeah. He had pull up yeah. in that, in that first half, but yeah, I guess the um, one other thing to note is painter for a second game. Now, uh, brings Zach up against the press yes. Yes. and, oh, um, good call. Gets gets tossed to him one time. He goes to the foul line and drills two. Um, I don't know how many seven foot plus guys in the country are out there that coaches trust to come down and receive the inbounds pass um, on press break. Just from the fact that generally they're not going to be really high percentage free throw shooters. Um, so that's a great luxury to have. Yeah. Yeah. I, one thing I wanted to add one thing to that because I know for probably two, three years now, it's like, why isn't Edie down there? Um, the, the pass where Edie gets fouled in the back by Cohen Carr, like I'm not confident Edie makes that play last year. He, he just is so much more like, like the past two years, I just don't think he makes that play. And so, yes, you could still use him as like a standstill, but that mobility has, hasn't been there to this degree. Um, even his hands, uh, they've been very good throughout. They've gotten better too. Like, that place specifically, I think, is probably a turnover if it happens last year, just to be honest. Um, this year, though, you can trust Edie a little bit more with that bit of mobility, um, knowing that if the pass isn't right on the money, Edie's probably still going to go get it. Yeah, I didn't understand Bardo when he was like, I, I don't know why Fletcher didn't pass it to Zach. He was wide open on when he calls the timeout because there were two guys and there was a little bit of a gap, but you got to throw that ball up so the the baskets, right? I mean, the, the backboard was in the way of Fletcher yeah. making that pass. I was like, I don't think you're looking at the trajectory. That ball was going to have to come in. Combine that with the fact that he calls Fletcher Foster like six times in this game. The dude has played two effing years in the Big Ten. Like, get his effing name right, Bardo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Bardo. Flip that, Greg. Clip yeah. that. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to clip it, but uh, we, yeah, yeah, Bardo. Uh, we, we can bring him on and, 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 and exchange some gripes with him, but yeah. Cause like Foster didn't even play in the big 10. It'd be one thing, you know, if, if he did, yeah, but, did. He or Michigan state. Yeah. Bardo? But he, he left. No, 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 not Bardo played oh. at Illinois, but yeah, was... Foster transferred yeah. out of Michigan state though. Right. Right. I mean, but he yes, played a couple of years there. Well, I'm not counting those. Okay. Uh, but to your <laughs> point, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Edie at the free throw line is better than two points the other way. Uh, and that that's that's a great point. I mean, you know, will Edie make both his free throws? Maybe, maybe not. But turning the basketball over is the last thing you want to do. So, yep. um, you know, to that point, I think that's that's well said there. Um, Blake Widmer, he played it three years at MSC Brex. All right, you know what? It, when we do shows here. I'm bound to say something stupid at some point. Okay. And so there you go. I gave it to you. One stupid comment an hour and 10 minutes into the show. I apologize. And Stephen Bardo can't get Fletcher's name right. And I forget that Foster lawyer played at MSU for three years. So there you go. I'm an idiot. You can clip 
that, David Jenkins. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let's get to game balls. I appreciate you guys. See, you that's why you guys, you know, bring the analysis and the expertise, and I bring the tomfoolery here at Boilers in the Stands. So, we appreciate you. So, let's kick it around the horn. Game balls all around. Uh, Craig. Start with you. I'm going last. Work. Nope, I'm going last. You're going last. That's not fair. Go ahead, Joe. Do you want to go or I'll go first? Sure. I'm going to go first, and it's probably I'm, I might be stealing this from Craig. I'm going with the basketball gods. The, the 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 game ball goes to the basketball gods for finally looking down on Purdue and giving them some grace. It's a year. That's very special for Purdue and they have some unfinished business to take care of in March. And there would have been nothing worse to end Zach Eady's career here in Purdue. If Braden Smith wasn't able to finish the season with him, his wingman, come on. Yep. And the, and, and the basketball gods looked down on Purdue and said, you know what? We've cursed you before, you know, Isaac Haas, Robbie Hummel, all the different things that have gone south for you guys in March. But today I'm going to give you guys a pass. And so thank you to the basketball gods for doing right by Purdue basketball, Purdue Boilermaker nation one time. Maybe we, we might need one more favor here in March. We'll see. Keep you on the hook. But at the same time, we are appreciative to you here today. So the basketball gods get my game ball. Mine's in a similar route. It's uh, Purdue training staff. It, Braden, Zach Eady, everybody's good. It's yeah, that's that's <laughs> who the game ball has to go to is uh, getting them back. Andy Andy Nup here also says game ball to Purdue training staff. Um, more than more than anything, health and uh, it seems like Purdue got out of there healthy. All right. Well, my plan didn't work. So, um, see, I'm you should have went in. first. Should have went first. You messed it up. No, because if I'd have gone first and then you guys would have picked those two, somebody would have been like, You don't give a game ball to Zach Eady when he goes for 29 Ooh. points and 12 <laughs> rebounds. So, no, I've got to give the game ball to Zach Eady here. Obviously, the driving force for which Purdue wins this game. Um, I assumed one of you was going to pick Edie, one of you was going to pick Jones, and then I was going to get to do like my my little my little shout out to Miles today. But no, nope, didn't happen. You can give up. Well, you can no, give a gonna... bonus ball. Give a bonus ball. Yeah. You well, gotta... I, I got to give a bonus ball to Lance Jones because he was See, my I was, second most actually... impactful player. I was going to shout out like as like the the honorary or whatever. Their shout out is just the bench in general. Um, they played more minutes. That includes Colvin. That includes Heidi. Like that was, I was, I was going to go there as well of like okay. uh, just the bench in large majority. And, and, and we didn't, I, I don't know how much you guys, I don't think we touched on Camden Heidi very much, but there was one point, you know, when we talk about like his dribbling really isn't up to where, you know, it, it, it can be here going forward, but there was a point in the game where he did start showing a little confidence, putting it on the deck. He put it behind his back and was trying to get to the rim. Uh, so it just seems like the more minutes he's getting out there, the more comfortable he's getting expanding his game. Uh, so that was one thing I definitely took note of in the first half when I was able to keep my eyes on it. So i um, excited yeah. to see him continue to um, develop. Yeah, no, I agree. And he's he can be a straight line driver. That's where he's at right now. Um, and with his athleticism and size, sometimes that's good enough. Like being yeah. a straight line driver isn't necessarily a knock, especially given your role. And his role is he's never going to have to really break guys down off the dribble, right? Whereas like a Colvin could eventually have to do that. Heidi's he's going to catch and he's going to go. And that's uh, he's shown that he can do that when needed for sure. Yep. Uh, uh, there's Dina. guys that have made 10 million a year in the NBA being a three point shooter, straight line driver and a defender. Yep. hundred percent. Chris Diaz in the chat saying unsung hero, Lance Jones. He is the X factor. Um, Andy Knapp as, as Bardo keeps catching strays here on boilers and sand <laughs> saying game ball to Bardo. If it's, if it's the last game he does for Purdue. Wait, this wait, I forgot. My game ball goes to foster lawyer. You played a hell of a game today there for Purdue. Go. We appreciate foster you. Lawyer. Yes, for sure. So, um, 
Yeah. So, all right. There's our, our um, game balls and bonus balls and everything else uh, here as we wrap things up. We'll get into some of our highlighted chats here uh, and we'll scroll through these. Um, Brad Prather says, Glenn said he has no idea where that backstory came from in his interview with Conzo Martin. Um, the, like the actual story about his back. I, I said Glenn Robinson's back when we were talking about injuries and Brad okay. said in an interview with Quan, with Conzo Martin this year that Glenn said that his back was never injured and he has no idea where that story came from. Okay. I didn't know what he was referencing there. Matt Spurgeon here saying, I saw Fletch pass up several shots tonight. Do you think that's by design to get the ball in the post or slow it down and slow it down? Or is it Fletch just really picky about his shots now? Joe? Um, I, I think it was more of just trying to get it to Edie and slow it down. It, it's so he's picky by design of that. Of we're trying to just slow the game down, get it to Edie, let him go to work. Um, he's not wasn't going to shoot it unless he was probably wide open. And I don't think it's like something to worry about going forward. I mean, we've seen uh, you know against the the previous game against Michigan State, Fletch went four of six from three. So um, I, I think he still has the shooting. He is now in the month of March. Six, eight. He is nine for 12 from three in the month of March so far in four games. Yep. And as you mentioned, Fletcher lawyer, uh, the leading three point shooter in the big, in big 10 play this year. And I think they said Mason Gillis was third, was um, third or fourth. I, I just saw that stat the third. other day. Yeah. Third. He was third in the big 10. So they have the first and third best three point shooters in big 10 play this season. Not to shabby uh blake widmer says but i have to recognize that this team has the heart of a champion and they want to win everything so i do know that is also a good thing it's just the emotional in swing endured by us fans is so hard in reference to you know them playing their guys you know their normal minutes and you know uh some of the injuries that uh they overcame here today and the, and the physicality of this game and we all know the physicality is coming tomorrow as well um, Jeff Nestor says Edie to become the leading produce score in his next game. Do we have the exact stats on that? How far he is away? It's 12 from or 14, 14 right. points away from passing Rick Mount. I always like when those things can get out of the way before the tournament starts. Cause like David Jenkins was approaching 2000 mm -hmm. points, um, you know, last year, but they needed to play a couple games in the tournament. So he ended up falling short in his career of hitting that goal. And um, so sorry, just to correct that real quick, he's with 13 points, he'll be the all time leading scorer. So he's 12 okay. points away. Yep. Yep. So I like that, that he can get that out of the way before we get into March Madness where none of that crap matters. And, and David Jenkins, I think would be the first to tell you like, when they're playing in the tournament last year, he's not worried about that. But at the same time, now that his career is over, I know there's some disappointment there, especially where he sacrificed being the leading scored and transfers over to Purdue. And, and ultimately that's part of the reason why he didn't, you know, get into the 2000 point score club, which is an elite, you know, place to be. And for Zach Eady, I I'm sure he's got bigger goals than being the all time leading scorer in Purdue men's basketball history. But at the same time, um, it is a great thing that he can look back on in his career, just another notch on his belt. And so I'm happy he'll be able to, you know, uh, knock that out tomorrow, uh, you know, in their game against potentially Wisconsin or Northwestern. Um, Tarek Lucic had a funny uh, chat here, said this game was like watching Final Destination. Uh, and I could definitely sympathize that if anybody knows the movie Final Destination, um, it definitely felt like that. Final Destination 1 or Final Destination 2, 3, 4, or 5? I don't know, but they're all terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, Jesus Christ, that was just the most terrifying thing ever. Jacob Foster here saying, rooting to lose is an interesting take. Our guys are fierce competitors and want to win every game. I trust Painter to make the right decisions. He knows that how the guys are feeling. Well, hey, like I said, Jacob, I understand if there was any pushback to that take, that's how I started the show. That's how we talked a lot about it. There's some fans that feel that way, and there's others that aren't going to. So you're welcome to push back on that take. Um, you know, for me, maybe it is a little bit of scared money, don't make money kind of thing. But at the same time, 
I probably, you know, not just from a, Hey, I'm worried they're going to get injured standpoint. Like I said, there's a lot of mileage, you know, on these guys this season and, and, and they've played a lot of minutes and maybe trying to switch up your rotations to an extent to keep their minutes down here this weekend. I might be something I implement, but Matt Painter probably would tell us on the show, well, we're not doing that because we're going to keep doing what we're doing and keep that consistency. So I, I see both sides of the argument, and, I, I, and I'm willing to keep an open mind to the discussion. Um, David Jenkins here you know, in the chat, as he always is, saying C game, but good minutes from Heidi and Colvin bumped that grade up. Uh, and these guys did a great job breaking down Miles Colvin's game here earlier in the show. So if you didn't see it, make sure you, when the show's over, to rewind back and watch that. Uh, Dead Hoosier asks, who would be the preferred matchup tomorrow? Craig, what do you think? I'll start with you. Honestly, I'm going to say with Northwestern because they're beat up and <laughs> with the amount of injuries that they have. Um, they, they gave us everything we wanted the last two times we played them, but I just think they're a different team right now. Well, and, and don't you also think, sorry, Joe, that Northwestern's a, a better team to get you ready for March? Is that a fair statement? That's kind of where I was going is like, you're going to play Northwestern and you might just get boo, you know, the boo zone, whatever. But um, if he puts up 45 and it happens and you lose, but mm -hmm. I, I agree. I, I'd rather see Northwestern in terms of like, I, I think in terms of like the, even just like the physicality and chippiness and stuff like Northwestern is going to be physical. That's what they do. They fall a lot. It just feels like a different type of physical than what we saw in that senior day game against Wisconsin. And that game just scares me thinking back on it. So um, that, and then also with Northwestern, like this Purdue should match up a little bit better now with Barry out. With that being said, like I said, boo boo, he can, can do boo booey things. Um, and, and that's going to, when, when March Madness does roll around, the thing that's going to be said more than anything is can Purdue handle guards? Um, boo booey is a, 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 a pretty good guard, I would say, to, to have that test go against. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I choose Northwestern for the reasons, uh, that Joe just stated. Uh, so we got, uh, Rowlett Boiler here in the chat saying, good to see Miles and Cam get some good run. Absolutely. Uh, and then we got a few more here as we wrap things up. Um, Heather Garrison says, I can never seem to find them on the autograph app until after the shows are over. I'm not sure which one of you highlighted this. Um, but it's, go ahead. it's because they only post in the podcast form, right, yeah. Joe? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Our live show itself is not on there, but they are able to take our podcast feed and throw it on there. Okay, that's a good clarification. Which we are on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts for anybody that is listening and, and wants to give us a five star review on audio. We would appreciate that. Yeah, we definitely appreciate that. It was try to grow our audience on our audio platform. Uh, once again, with Autograph, make sure you're hitting up the QR code that you see here on the screen. If you can't see it on the screen, head over to the Autograph app, which is available, uh, you know, on Android and on iPhones. And make sure you use the promo code BITS when you sign up. It's all free. Uh, and we appreciate Autograph for being a sponsor here on the show. Uh, so once again, use that QR code to get in there. Use the promo code BITS when you do. Um, and then we also have Dick Stillwagon enjoying the fact that Juwan Howard was fired from Michigan. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? I just got the joke in his name for the first time. Like I knew it was a fake name, but until you said it the way you did, I just got the joke in his name. What's the um, joke? Well, we'll Am talk off air. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk um, off air, Greg. <laughs> yeah. Um, my thoughts on Jawan Howard is just like it was going to happen. It, Break it into three words, Greg. Break it into three words instead of two. You know what's so funny? I, I can't believe I can't believe this is happening. But and CHGO Bears, somebody somebody did a super chat where they were like, "Well, it was our free agency week in the NFL. It's a big week, and we had huge shows, big numbers, a lot of people tuning in." And somebody put a super chat to Carm and said, or or to to all of us, and said, "What if they signed Bofa?" And I knew what the reference was, being the child that I am, and. But Mark and Adam, my co-host, they did not. So I had Mark Carmen read it. And he was like, oh, does he mean Bosa? And I was like, no, he means Bofa. 
And he was like, what's Bofa? <laughs> he walked oh. right into it. So now all week it's become like this comedy of children with then somebody did Ligma a couple days ago. And then today there was another one. So now I'm getting it because I don't get this and I, I'm trying to get it. Uh, but we'll save it for off the air because this is an adult show and CHGO <laughs> bears is a show for, you know, you know, immature children, but here we're professionals, uh, but I just did fall for it. So Carm will enjoy the fact that I got, got, uh, maybe that's my karma for the week for messing with those guys. So, um, that wraps it. Did you guys have any thoughts on Juwan Howard though? Going back to that. It needed to happen. That's, yeah. that's all I got. It, it had to happen. Yeah, it needed to happen. Um, I'm sure somewhere G Wizzy is celebrating. Um, I don't really get Purdue fans like celebrating it because I'd love to have to, uh, you know, get to play a Juwan Howard coach team for one more year. But whatever. Uh, right. What that, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, because Michigan certainly has the resources. And if they get it right, then that becomes, oh, you they're know, they're a sleeping a real- giant. Yeah, they're a sleeping giant. I mean, where their program is at is kind of shocking at this point. When Purdue took their stadium over, I get it was spring break for them. Uh, you just don't see that that often. Uh, so, you know, depending on who they hire, do you guys have any predictions on who they could potentially hire? John Beeline. Bring back, run it back with Beeline. I know. I've I've heard, I've heard rumors, not from any great sources, but I've heard rumors that maybe he'll throw his hat back into the coaching ring. I don't. I don't really got any names. I'd have to like actually dive into it and see what I come up with. But it'll be. Maybe, it'll be interesting. Maybe Ant Wright. There, yeah. You have Ant, Ant. Wright. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Ant Ant's Wright. Well, shout out to our guy Ant. Put your name in the billing to be the next Michigan head coach. We appreciate Ant Wright. He always shows us some love on Twitter. So we're sure he's going to make the jump from GA Aiden? to uh, Michigan head coach. Yeah, Aiden. Well, you know, he's from incarnate. That- you know, it would be quite the turn from the previous coach because he's shown that he can break up fights and riots. True. That's rather true. Than it, rather than instigating. And, and, and if uh, <laughs> if they try to give Sasha Stefanovic a call, I will be blocking them. So that's not happening. You can stay away from PJ Thompson. You can t- stay away from Sasha. You can stay away from uh, Coach Brantley. You, you can just stay away from our coaching staff. Thank you very much here with the Purdue Boilermakers. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, like for real though. I mean, we just saw you know, uh, you know, a, a head coach go to you know Penn State, Notre Dame that comes from Purdue. Yeah. Is yeah. is is Coach? I don't Brant- know that we have anybody on this staff currently. I I don't I don't know this for sure, but it just hasn't seemed like maybe that's Brantley's desire. It seems, I mean, he's kind of said before, he's just like, he likes his spot. Like he's yeah, paid well for it too. And, and he gets to do what he like, what he wants in terms of like the coaching organization. Right. Obviously there's rules in that, but um, you know, I, I've, yeah, I've, I've heard that as well, where he's just like, he's, he likes it here. He's comfortable with this spot. Yeah. Um, I don't, we don't have anybody on staff right now that would be no. ready right. to make a Michigan level jump. Uh, Tariq Kimmel, uh, Craig Bowers is a suggestion. Mm. I mean, um, I mean, Craig and Joe, I, you know, I, I think mean, that would on. be, oh. I think that would be a great sleeper move because Purdue would be guaranteed two wins every year. That's what, I mean, I, that's what I was just going to say is well, let's just all coach a big 10 team, but <laughs> we're still going to have this show just like, it's going to be, we're, we'll figure out the details, but then we're just going to guarantee Purdue six wins. So my um, team would be terrible, but my press conferences would take three and a half hours when I answer questions. That's, I think, what we know about me. Uh, Icy Mike says, how about Joe? He has the whiteboard. He didn't do the whiteboard today, but we're not going to hold that against him. But tomorrow we are going to make him do something with the X's and O's because it's I, a, it's I, our I, award-winning you- segment and, you know, this is how we win Oscars here at Boilers in the Stands. My excuse is I was just in shambles about Brain Smith's leg. <laughs> That's like, fine. I get it. <laughs> just, you get on the work. whiteboard and, and just, just draw a, a, a sad face with yeah. a cry, crying face emoji. Um, that would have probably been um, there. Yes, this is the Midwestern goodbye. We are in the Midwestern goodbye segment of the show. Uh, we've hit the hour and a half mark, so we're going to wrap things up here. We'll be right back here tomorrow, so we're not going anywhere. So make sure you hang out with us immediately following the game. 
uh, against whether it's Northwestern or Wisconsin. You guys all can enjoy the second half. Shout out to Derek Lucic, uh, giving us a, a little bit of a, some love here in the chat. Um, so, you know, uh, appreciate everybody hanging out. And then we did have one more comment here from Jack Horton saying, appreciate Braggs, Craig and Joe's great coverage. That means a lot from all of you. Thank you again. Uh, we will see you tomorrow. Purdue survives and advances March madness. We are here. Big time thing i see mike final thought brags would have one question that lasts 45 minutes and go nowhere in the postgame presser at michigan i i hey know thyself i completely agree with you scott white great show as always as you always do boiler up dead hoosier we will see you tomorrow uh, we appreciate everybody's support excited for another game so tune in tomorrow and always boiler up